when Scott asked me to, to talk tonight and actually tried to focus me in on one role, it was difficult for me to do uh, because I actually started out as a hacker, right? And now I'm actually more of a hustler or, or storyteller, uh, wear a couple of different hats. But I'm going to kind of take you through my transition, how I started out as a hacker, and now how I've become a hustler, and the difference in the two roles, and, and in some ways, some of the difficulties that I've had making that transition, and then give you some advice about whatever role you're in. So uh, this is me, circa 19, uh, 1999, 2001. I actually was in People Magazine. Um, this, is, this is from People Magazine in October of 2000, I believe. Um, I'm very unusual. I'm a, a I was a female chief technology officer. So I started my career as a programmer and uh, worked my way to chief technology officer for a fast growing dot com, one of the fastest actually in the country at that point in time. And I was also a woman, which meant that I was the only woman in the room at any of these events. Um, so I'm going to actually talk you through a little bit. I touched my first computer in high school. I was a senior in high school when they offered the very first computer science class. And I would never have taken that class had I been not forced to take it, take it by my math teacher. I skipped math all the time. I just blew it off. I didn't go, but I got straight A's, so I couldn't really get in trouble. And um, he basically said, I'm going to turn you in if you don't take my computer science class, which was first period in the morning, second semester, senior year, which I did not want to do. But this is a TRS-80, so that's what I learned to program on, very first computer that I ever touched. Um, I am so thankful to Dr. Bretter, who is my math teacher, <laughs> for turning me on to computers and, and teaching me um, that my job could be fun and I could solve puzzles all day long. Um, after college, I went to work in corporate America. And these are some of the companies that I worked with or for. I spent most of my time at EDS, Electronic Data Systems. I went through their systems engineer development training program after getting a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Computer Science. Um, and these were, most of these others, with the exception of Indus, were customers of EDS. So I traveled. I moved 11 times in the first three years out of college. Um, traveling for EDS and, and basically we would do six to nine month projects at these large corporations and they would pick up the entire team and move us into corporate apartments um, for a short stint to get the project off the ground. And um, eventually got sick of that, left that world, joined Indus, at the time it was called TSW International. Um, TSW International was my first exposure sort of to a startup. It was about 100 people when I joined. It grew to about 600 people before it was acquired. The interesting thing is this is why I got into startups. I had 10,000 shares of, of stock that was given to me for doing programming at TSW International. And when Indus bought them, a publicly traded company acquired the company, all of a sudden that was worth a lot of money. And I was like, wow, there's something to these stock options. They're not just a piece of paper. And it was at that point in time that I was approached to co-found a startup. So my first startup, as Scott alluded to, uh, was called eTor. It was, um, we used to call it a surf engine. Um, behind the scenes is a search engine, a technology that I wrote. Um, is very much like stumble upon today. So it was stumble upon before stumble upon existed. You would sign up for our service and or just come to the site and tell us what you were looking for and we would make recommendations to you. And we did so actually in a, in a frame set and um, you, it's kind of channel surfing the web. You could see one site at a time. Um, we grew from four co-founders to over 160 people. We raised $42 million in venture capital. As chief technology officer, I had a staff of 60 people reporting to me. And we were acquired by Ask Jeeves, ask.com, uh, in 2001. Um, so I got into entrepreneurship late, but I was the hacker, right? We were an overnight success. People always used to tell us we were an overnight success. So we were founded in August of 1997. We raised a friends and family round in January of 1998. We launched our beta in April of 98. We came out of beta in June of 98. 
we got a new office, new name, and first real investment in the summer of 99. Uh, we were named the stickiest website on the internet. Our average time spent on site was over 20 minutes, and that was consistent from 99 through 2001 at the time of our sale. And we raised money here. So I just want to point out for people that don't really know a lot about startups is I went, I was paid zero until July of 1999 as chief technology officer and co-founder, right? Um, so I had planned, I was in a position where I had planned to do this, um, but honestly, my deadline for quitting was June of 1999. My co-founders knew that there was a line in the sand that was June 1st, 1999. If we have not raised some money and we can't get paid a little bit, my first salary was $35,000, by the way, uh, right? If I can't get that $35,000, I can't do this anymore. Now, of course, with an investment coming in in July means that we knew it was coming in early June. So obviously, I never left. I wrote it out. I was probably the last person standing. Um, that's not entirely true. But um, I, I actually went on and worked for Ask for about a year and a half. Um, so we raised our $10 million funds. It was actually from what we would today call super angels. So we raised all that money from people here. They're primarily individual angels that all made significant contributions to that, that $10 million in order to keep us in town. Had they not come through, we would have moved to Silicon Valley. Right. So we. So here's the funny thing. Here's our launch party. Right. So when did we launch? We launched in April. Came out of beta in June of '98, and in October of 1999 was when we had our launch party. <laughs> right. Um, we hit f half a million subscribers in 1999. One million subscribers just some subscribers, so obviously we were ratcheting it up our growth, and then we were acquired by Ask.com in June 2001. So really crazy ride. Um, throughout that time, we raised another $32 million round before we were acquired, and I went on to work for Ask. So what does it mean to be a hacker in a web platform in 1997? There is no cloud. There is no Amazon Web Services. There is no rack space. Um, there's barely co-location facilities. I co-located my first servers at MindSpring, who did not have a business service. I literally called up somebody at MindSpring and said, I need some place to put my servers. And they said, we have a room we could put that in, <laughs> OK? So there was no, so literally we had to buy the servers, we had to install them. At, 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 there was times that I had to call MindSpring at four o'clock at night and be like, we're coming over, <laughs> right? Let us in, because we got problems. Um, so that's where we started. We started with one server in a rack at MindSpring. Um, and, and everything was done on that one server. You know, no different tiers of architecture, right? The database was on that, the middle tier was on that, and, and the front end website was on that as well. That's how we started, right? Um, I learned very quickly that the web is about hardware. Handling lots of traffic is mostly about hardware. A little bit about making sure that your database is structured right and it's tuned and some other things, that your front end's structured properly and that your code's structured properly. But when you're talking about having 3 million visitors spend 20 minutes on your site in a single hour window, you're talking about a lot of hardware. So this is actually our production network. Um, this was actually in one of the, the presentations that we had to give to ask as part of our due diligence was how do, what's the special sauce and how does all this work? So this was actually at the end. Um, we had 32 load balanced web servers taking the traffic, right? Uh, we had about 10 middle tier servers. And then the primary production database servers were um, two big Sun Solaris machines 
um, running uh, against an EMC data storage device. We had over a terabyte of data in 1999, so that was a huge amount of data for the time. We tracked every single site that you visited. If you came through our site and you did a search, we knew every single site that you visited. We knew how long you were on it. We knew how many clicks you went into it. And we knew um, whether or not you shared it with a friend, you gave it a thumbs up or thumbs down. So there was intrinsic and explicit ways that we monitored whether or not you liked the site. You could tell us that you liked the site, but we could also make an implied definition of whether or not you liked the site. And all that went back into delivering the next site to you. So to try and make sure that we were delivering the absolute best sites for what you were looking for right now. So you know, that just kind of gives you a perspective of, of, of what that looked like at the time. Um, and that's just one of the data centers. We had a smaller data center. Uh, this one was here, actually, at level three downtown. And then, OK, then the next, um, the other one was in California, but much smaller because it was really just a failover situation. It's too close to my phone. Um, <laughs> Many a uh, night I was at the data center. I, I had, as chief technology officer, I coded on Fridays. That was my role. I, I always liked to stay in the code, so I still coded on Fridays. I still wanted to be a hacker. I still wanted to know what was going on. I had a skunks work team that worked on d future projects with me. Um, and if the team was in at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was in at 4 o'clock in the morning was my role. So if there was something going on and somebody was going to have to make a decision whether to roll back a release or roll back a fix, it was my decision to make as chief technology officer. So I was there. These are some other companies that I went on to work for after eTOR. And then, of course, you know a little bit about my, well, a little bit, my transition to Hustler. So after doing all these technology startups, all of a sudden I had realized that I had all these ideas. Right, that I wanted to pursue. So the most recent ones that I've done, and they started at exactly the same time, never start two startups at the same time, are Startup Chicks and NextVent. Startup Chicks is a 501c3. We currently have 1350 members, 25 states. Uh, we've, we have an accelerator program. We've had over 27 female founders graduate in the last four years. My role there is the face. I'm the face of Startup Chicks, and most of what I do is coaching, and trying to raise money, right? I gotta go out, I gotta sell. If Startup Chicks is gonna continue and it's gonna live, I gotta sell. I gotta sell to people, women that are gonna join Startup Chicks. I gotta sell to women that are gonna start Startup Chicks chapters in other cities so we can be a global organization and I gotta sell the sponsors, right? Next fence, similar. I started out, um, I coded the front end, or the, the mobile apps for Next fence, even though I was CEO. And I came to the realization about a year into it that I actually jeopardized the future of this business because I was doing the wrong things. If there was a bug, I was spending my time fixing the bug instead of making the sales call. Right? So again, have to be out there making sales if you're a hustler. Right? So I made this list of hacker versus hustler. So I kind of share with you, okay, right? When I was a hacker, most of the time it was someone else's idea. When I was the hustler, it's been my idea. You know, hacker, I wrote the first version of the code. <laughs> Hustler, I still did the last time, but I don't anymore. Um, why would the office fix the printer? Okay, one of the dirty little secrets is if you're the chief technology officer of a company, it doesn't matter, like, that, that, that's the title. If the printer's broken and your the CEO's trying to print out slides to take to a, uh, an investor meeting, you gotta damn well fix that printer now. <laughs> Drop everything you're doing to fix the printer because that meeting is really important, right? As a hacker, especially when closing money, investors, I was the closer. Okay, this is important to think about. Um, as a chief technology officer for a start startup, you are, if you're the technology person, the business people have already met with the investors. You are the last person on the team that the investor meets with. And if you say something different, or if you're not confident that you can achieve the mission, you will not get that money. So you are the closer of that round, right? As a hustler, I'm the, I'm the darling for dollars, right? I'm the cold caller trying to make both sales and raising money, right? You know, before I grew a tech team, I was really focused on the people. Now I'm growing a company. 
you know what? When I'm growing a company, I hate to say this, but money is more important to me right now. Making sure that I have cash flow so that my people can build their teams, not so that, right? Cash flow, I gotta have money, right? I'm the face of the company. Before I was an architect and problem solver. No matter what they say, it's always a 24 by 7, 365 job. Hacker, I had a lot of time to strategize and plan. Now I have no quiet time. The last couple ones are interesting, right? As a CTO, my job is to be the pessimist. My job is to figure out what's going to cause something to break before it breaks and fix it or have a plan to fix it so that it doesn't take us down, right? If you're making ten to $40,000 an hour at 20 cents a click, you can't be down, right? As a hustler, you've got to be the optimist. You've got to always be looking at the positive sign. We are going to get through this, right? So it's like two different sides of, of, of the world. Both are lonely jobs. I'm not going to lie to you. Right? You're the CTO, you're up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're trying to d figure out how to solve the problem or your team's trying to figure out how to solve the problem. Are you going to roll back or not? Right? Lonely job being a CEO because what if you're running out of money? Right? Can I make payroll this week? How many people should I tell that I might not make payroll? Right? Lonely job. Right? Um, one other thing. Hacker usually stays at exit. Like I said, I was with Ask for about two years afterwards. CEO, my company got acquired. I was gone three weeks later. <laughs> Right, my last company, right? So different, different role. So something to think about, who are you, right? It doesn't really matter. Uh, pick a role and go for it. Be the best CTO you can, be the best CEO you can. Um, have clearly defined roles in your founding team, right? It's great through customer discovery and stuff that you need to like have everyone on the same page, but then divide and conquer, right? Fully commit. This is 400% effort, right? Have a startup prenup, right? So have the conversation, have the tough questions answered. Know what's going to happen if somebody gets sick or hit by a car or decides to drop out in two years. What are you going to do with the company? And then lastly is just enjoy the ride. It's awesome. It's fun. It's crazy. It's a lot of adrenaline, highs, lows, but it's awesome. That's all I got for you. Thanks.